you for turning out on this lovely spring Continuing education Rocky's knows day. that at the end, students want to graduate. We believe that there's an option for every student. We are there to help students and serve them. It's, it's our mission. And education is transformational. It changes lives. I was supposed to tell you something about our affiliation so you understand how we ended up here. Um, my affiliation at this point is simply library nerd. Um, I've just finished a five-year commission, a uh, five-year term on the Boulder Library Commission, and I am a lifelong reader. I'm sort of on the mic. Is that better? Okay, great. I'll just sort of cuddle up to it here. Um, so I'm a longtime reader of, of fiction, and I'm old enough that I now feel like I'm living some of the realities I read about in my youth, which is somewhat disconcerting, I must say. Um, before I introduce the panelists, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first, if you haven't si uh, silenced your devices, this would be a really good time to do that. Thank you. Um, as in all sessions, we will be taking questions from you all. I see some of you have already found the app, so you know the drill there. There's two ways that you can um, send questions in. One is to go to the CWA app, and there's a section on this session that says submit a question. You can type that in, and the wonders of technology will make it appear up here in the screen. There are also producers in the aisles who have note cards if you prefer the old-fashioned way of writing something down and sending it out. If you are a student, please indicate that on your question card since we do try to give students um, priority. Okay, let me introduce our wonderful panel today. So, first of all, to my left here is Seth Shostak. Seth's focus is on outer space. He's an astronomer. He works with the SETI group, the scientific study of looking for life in the universe. Um, he has authored an astrobiology textbook. I'm very interested to know what an astrobiology textbook is about. And he has a weekly podcast called Big Picture Science. Um, he also says that he was born too early because he has He's too early to get to the cure for death, so I'd be interested in what that's about as well. <laughs> Next in line is Mary Reynolds Thompson. Mary's focus is on inner space, and she focuses on healing our spirits, connecting our spirituality to the earth. I think there's a piece of, of healing the earth and healing ourselves at the same time. She's a writer. She works with a lot of writers. She proudly identifies herself as a Luddite, <laughs> so I told her we were in good company there. So we look forward to her insights. And then the uh, last one in the row here is Will Hertling, and Will's focus is on technology. He is a writer of techno thrillers, those, those futures where technology has somehow made life better for us, but also not made life better for us, taking us over in some cases. Um, he focuses on artificial intelligence and data ownership and privacy and issues of trust in this world of technology, which I think will be an interesting thing to explore. And his books are used by the U.S. Air Force in combat strategy training. <laughs> so I think the order we're going to go here is first Seth, and then Will, and then Mary. As those of you who have seen me before know, I usually stand up for these remarks to afford the audience a uh, more likely target. Um, <laughs> you know, when fiction predicts fact, well, then it's not fiction anymore. So this is sort of a, a contradictory <laughs> title for this thing. But uh, fiction that predicts things is usually a reference to sci-fi. And given the, the composition of the panel here, a sci-fi writer and somebody who thinks that sci-fi ought to be banned, <laughs> I mean, I'm... I'm a <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, sci-fi. I mean, that isn't to say you couldn't have uh, other predictive stories, right? I mean, I don't know. You could write a romantic uh, story about the, the, the poor boy on the wrong side of the tracks and finally, you know, can never get to the, the woman he would like to love, but then the railroad abandons that branch line, pulls up the rails, and suddenly he's not on the wrong side of the tracks. But that, that's just something in which if <laughs> fiction could become fact, I suppose, but it's not science fiction. So let me just talk about science fiction because I know about half of that, which is the fiction part. Okay, uh, science fiction is generally of two kinds. I mean, it, there are two aspects to it that I think are relevant for this, this little panel here. One is it makes predictions about society and it makes predictions about 
you know, the kind of technology we're going to have. And that's maybe the, the more interesting stuff because everybody's interested in technology and maybe you don't care what society is like in the 25th century, but you want to know how your cell phone will be better. Well, <laughs> but let me start with the societal predictions. And most of those are quite grand. I mean, there's, there's, it's not that they've made slight improvements in today's society. It isn't that, you know, the sci-fi of the future is set in what today is a third world country and now they all have split level homes, you know, two car garages, a pool, a pet, and the PTA, right? That isn't the kind of prediction they're making. They're making predictions that have grand organizational structure. I have a couple down here. The United Federation of Planets, for example, if you're a Star Trek fan, and if you, and if you are, you can probably get help for that. The, so <laughs> I, I, I've, I've noted many times that the, the United Federation of Planets is, in fact, headquartered in the San Francisco Bay Area. <laughs> and I've, and while I took this as a compliment, it's a terrible place to put the United Federation of Plants because, you know, every couple of hundred years it'll be, you know, it'll rumble to death in an earthquake. I wouldn't put it there, but they did. Okay, uh, you know, also the Galactic Republic, the Galactic Empire, or the New Republic for you uh, Star Wars fans. Okay, um, well, of course, none of this makes sense. None of it is going to become fact. And the reasons for that are simple and twofold. To begin with, they're... These, these, you know, the United Federation of Planets, what are you going to have? The United Federation of Bright Stars? I mean, <laughs> there isn't much of a federation. You burned up again. It's, it doesn't make any sense because, you know, they're too far apart temporally. That is in time, hmm. right? Because in science fiction, the, the, the classic scene being the uh, cantina scene in the, in the first Star Wars, right? We get a whole bunch of species from around the galaxy and sit around, have a beer, listen to some bad music. Okay, but, but that isn't going to happen. The universe is 14 billion years old. Let's say that the first intelligent species arose 10 billion years ago. So just imagine a giant, you know, uh, wheel of fortune. Okay, Vanna. There's this giant wheel of fortune with numbers on it from one to 10 billion. Okay, you spin that to find out, well, how far advanced is the next society that we could hear from because they've got to be more advanced, otherwise we don't hear from it. So you spin the wheel. What are the chances that it's gonna come up with a thousand years or fewer. You know, almost none. They're gonna come out being millions on average, five billion years more advanced than we are. The idea that they're gonna sit down at a bar with you to have a beer, right, is, is <laughs> like you sitting down with a bunch of bacteria. Hey, let's have a beer. Okay, so that, well, kind of think of it, the bacteria are in the beer. It occurs to me, so okay. All right, okay, so, so maybe that does make sense. Uh, but so that, that doesn't work. You're, you're not going to get a federation of different species. They're too far apart in time. But if that wasn't bad enough, they're also too far apart in space. Space is big. Some of you may know that. And in fact, because of the speed of light, which we think uh, is the ultimate speed limit in the, in the cosmos, and, and that's physics, and it's hard to beat that, by the way. You, you probably think, oh, well, that's just a matter of technology. We'll have faster than light uh, speed, uh, communication, travel will tell Scotty in the engine room to give us warp seven or something like that, or we'll use quantum entanglement to communicate with, with the cosmos instantaneously. None of that works, because it violates causality in physics. So it's fairly fundamental. I don't think that'll happen. And what that means, of course, is that if there's some bad guys over here, Right, and I made a list of uh, galactic bad guys. The Xenomorphs, <laughs> the Predators, the Terminators, the Borg, the, the Daleks, the Cylons. I mean, they're, you know, they're endless lists, just in case you didn't know where they were. The Daleks, I always figure you get away from the Daleks by just going upstairs, right? Isn't, isn't that true? I don't know. The Dalek Cylons, it sounds like most of the aliens are named either after pharmaceuticals or new materials for making uh, shirts. Okay, anyhow. <laughs> But, but suppose they're causing trouble over here, right? They're, they're, hey, we need some help because the Cylons are giving us a hard time, right? And so they, you know, they, they radio to the center of the galactic, or the new republic, I guess, and say, send some help. But the help can't go any faster than the speed of light. So by the time the help gets there, whatever the Cylons had in mind, they've done it. In fact, everybody in that sector is now a Cylon. So that doesn't make any sense either. So all these grand visions for society they're grand visions, but they're, I don't think they're realistic. They're not going to become a fact. Uh, it, you know, it's said sometimes that all government is local. Well, I think in the cosmos that's probably going to be true because of these physical constraints. 
Okay, let me just move on very briefly because I know you're getting stultified to um, technology. Now, the track record for predicting technology is actually miserable, right? When I was a kid, they still had the uh, uh, Flash Gordon. You could see him on television in case you're no longer in the theaters, so but you could see him on television. Flash Gordon, who these guys dressed up like, I don't know, the members of the uh, Chinese Empire, in fact. I never quite understood that. They carried swords. I mean, they had rockets and so forth, but they carried swords. And, but the, all the predictions about what the future was going to be like, you know, here's the control, the control cabin of some rocket ship. It has big dials and levers and things like that, right? None of that. You haven't seen any of that. Uh, I, I think that the reason for that is because nobody foresaw the development of high capability computing in small packages. And probably the reason that they didn't see that, because if you go to any technological uh, installation, whether it's a power plant or a radio observatory, whatever, you know, there are no big <laughs> panels with dials and nuts, you know, spinning tape drives and all that. Yeah, there's none of that. It's just a couple of screens, people are sitting behind screens, just like you, right? Okay, well, and I, I think the reason they didn't see that coming is because they didn't appreciate what quantum mechanics meant, right? Mm -hmm. Quantum mechanics made a lot of this stuff possible. That, that phone in your pocket, you know, it's made possible by quantum mechanics. And the quantum mechanics was developed mostly in the 1920s, the early 1920s, and the physicists themselves that did that didn't even know what it was going to lead to. In fact, one of them was uh, famously said, yeah, this is kind of interesting, this quantum mechanics, but there's absolutely no possible application of it, <laughs> right? So even he, I mean, you know, somebody you'd think would know. That's fewer than 100 years ago, right? So, you know, the predictions are generally bad. Uh, there's some technology you could see maybe were predicted, like cell phones. That's often brought up, right? Ah, uh, Star Trek communicators. <laughs> Kirk out, Kirk in, Kirk out, right? <laughs> Well, that, 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 that's what led to the cell phone. Well, the guy who invented this cell phone, this guy by the name of Marty Cooper, he's a very lovely guy. He's, he lives in San Jose. I've talked to him on occasion at Star Trek conventions and other, <laughs> other intellectual venues. And, <laughs> and I asked him, I mean, I, he, he gets to say this, ask this probably every, every 30 minutes. So, you know, you guys got your idea from the Star Trek communicators, right? He said, no. We developed the cell phone before Star Trek, right? So even that wasn't predicted. Flying cars predicted, not yet developed. They've been predicted for a long time, actually. Now you think about it. Ordinary cars are constrained to one dimension. It's called the road. <laughs> and look at, we kill 30,000 people a year by giving them access to a machine that's constrained to one dimension. <laughs> Suppose they have three dimensions. <laughs> I, I just, I don't see it. Uh, th th here's an example that might, might work. Hal, remember Hal 9000, right? <laughs> well, we have Alexa now, mm -hmm. right? So maybe that's Hal 8000. <laughs> Open the pod by doors, Alexa. <laughs> I'm sorry, Seth, I can't do that. Okay, so, <laughs> well, well there, I mean, there obviously are some technologies where it's a, it's a clear near-term future, you know, implantable chips in, in your brain or, or surfing the web without having to use a mouse or a keyboard and all these sorts of things. Those are predictable. Uh, but others are not so predictable, and I just name a few here. Uh, genetic engineering, CRISPR technology, right? I'm sure there are panels about that. That's kind of, uh, on the one hand, very promising in terms of disease and sort of unpromising when it comes to re-engineering half the population, preferably the population living in Boulder. Okay. <laughs> and what if you, because you mentioned that I was born too soon to benefit from the cure for death, but imagine that they do that, <laughs> right? Cure for death. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ralph. I know you want tenure here at CU, but... <laughs> You know, Professor Fudnick's been in that position for 80,000 years, and he's not going anywhere. <laughs> you're not, not going to get that position. You better, you know, find a gas station where you can work. Okay. And, of course, the most uncertain technology of all is artificial intelligence. So um, th 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 that's why I say predicting technology is really a loser's game. You really can't do that. And in particular, if we develop new physics, which, of course, we will, who knows where that will go. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, I, I just want to quit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can follow that up. Um, well, let's see. I, um, I write science fiction, and I try to predict the future. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, let's see. So I just don't even know how to follow that up. That's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so one of the things that happened was that I read about um, 
let's say about 10 years ago, I read two books, uh, Ray Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near, which is a nonfiction book about artificial intelligence and extrapolating trends in technology to when would we be able to simulate a human brain and, and have artificial intelligence on a level of human capacity or greater and then what happens afterwards. Um, that same year, I read Charles Strauss's book, Accelerando, which is also a fictional version of what happens during the technological singularity. And what both of those books made me think about was that there was a pretty big gap in science fiction when it came to really looking at artificial intelligence. There were only a limited number of issues that we looked at. Is AI alive or not? Does it have rights or not? Is it gonna kill us or not? Mm. Like those are pretty simple questions and they are interesting to explore, but there's a whole lot more that's interesting about it. Like let's say we have to cohabitate this planet with another sentient species that's AI that you know lives life at a different rate than we do, right? That's an interesting area to explore. There's a lot more that could be explored there. So I wrote a series of four books exploring that at 10 year intervals because I wanted to look at how does technology develop over time and base it upon what we know about trends in computer science, how do computer processing speeds increase, how do our connections to the internet increase. And that approach can be helpful for looking at certain kinds of technology. Like um, I talked about earlier this morning, if you wanna write about neural implants and you wanna set a book in 2020, well, it's not very plausible because neural implants aren't of a scale that they're deployable in our brains at that point in time. But if you look to the 2030s at the rate of miniaturization of computers, you go, we, it's pretty plausible we're gonna have uh, neural implants at that time. Now, if you wanna tell a cohesive science fiction story, you have to look at what other developments are gonna happen between now and then. Are we gonna have self-driving cars? How does that affect our transportation infrastructure? Um, does uh, where's artificial intelligence? Does that lead to more unemployment? So you have to sort of roll the whole world forward and play this game of what if uh, as things go forward. And that certainly gets hard and there's certainly been lots of cases of people getting it wrong. Um, for me looking at science fiction, it was this gap of people not really looking at artificial intelligence at all. Most science fiction goes forward hundreds of years or thousands of years and artificial intelligence isn't a main feature of the story, even though it would now seem like that would be the predominating factor, right? Or why does data ever miss? Mm. Um, you know, it's super frustrating if you're watching Star Trek these days. Um, I would argue that I think there are plenty of people who are inspired by science fiction. It doesn't mean that they have gotten specific products out of it, right? Uh, Elon Musk is not building the enterprise, um, but he is undoubtedly, um, inspired by that vision of space as our manifest destiny, which I think anybody who grew up on watching Star Trek believes. Um, I know that we have the speed of light, but I'm still convinced we're gonna <laughs> you know, be traveling the galaxy faster than light someday. I don't know how that's gonna happen. Um, you know, the Kindle was something where the Kindle product team was actually inspired by Neil Stevens, the diamond age, in terms of designing the physicality of the product. Um, so there are cases of people doing this. Um, there's cases of uh, what's now called science fiction prototyping or fiction prototyping or fiction design. Um, so if you have a company that uh, is trying to figure out their vision for the future, either their vision for the company as a whole or product somewhere in the future, they will work with companies that will get a whole team of science fiction writers to say, write about what would a washing machine look like in 10 or 15 years. Um, and they'll send that out to as many as like 300 writers, get back 100 short fiction stories about washing machines 10 mm. years in the future, um, and then pick the best of those, further develop mm. them. So we're sort of mining that game of what if that science fiction writers like to play in order to try to figure out where we're going in the future. Um, what else was I gonna say? I, I it, going back to this idea of vision, right? Um, I was giving a talk, and granted it was at a science fiction convention, mm -hmm. but I was talking about artificial intelligence and how people who work in AI today say, there's not a lot of drive to create a general artificial intelligence. That companies wanna work on narrow AI to solve a specific problem. I wanna drive a car, or I wanna schedule employees at a company, or I wanna monitor whether people are stealing and they want AI to solve those specific problems and there's money in solving those problems, there's not money in creating uh, an AI that's gonna talk to you like in the movie Her. But, mm. you know, at, and that granted it was a science fiction convention, but if I, I asked people to raise their hand if they wanted a friend like Data, and everybody does, right? Mm. 
So there's this passion for things that don't necessarily always have a monetary value right in the current day. Um, and I say the same thing for flying cars. Like flying cars, people have a vision of that and people keep working on that, right? And the problem, of course, is the driver. And now that we're entering the age of autopilot, it's actually easier to fly something in the air than on the ground. Um, so flying cars are more feasible. And even though if you talk to transportation experts, they're like, you know, flying cars don't solve any problems. Like people want it. It's a vision that they've been given and they want to get it someday. As Monty Python says, now for something <laughs> completely different. <laughs> So Seth has given me a great line for a beginning novel. A bacteria walks into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful for this line. One day it will live itself into a novel. Um, and I love the, just the question, what if? What if, you know, this is what we're sitting it with. It's the, we could call this like the what if. Um, I'm really glad this isn't what science fiction predicts about the future, but what fiction predicts about the future, because I'm not a science fiction reader, um, but I am a fiction reader. And sometimes I think it's really useful to go back in time and kind of look at what people were doing a century or two ago and what they were writing about and the kind of reality that we're living today. So for me, one of the most interesting times in fiction and also in terms of cultural changes is the 19th century, right? So this was the age of the great novels of Dickens and Tolstoy and Flaubert and so on and so forth. And it was also this time of incredible disruption with the Industrial Revolution, right? So we're in the midst of the technological revolution, but this was the really the beginning of accelerated change. And incredible shifts in the way societies were living, they move from you know, um, living in the country to the towns, the change in economies, all kinds of things. Issues of pollution, issues of women's issues, workers' rights, all these things were emerging at that time. Um, and it's really hard if we're talking about the future to think of Jane Austen as a futurist, right? Who thinks of the creator of Emma and Mansfield Park as this great future thinker? But in a way, she really was. And, you know, in her novels, uh, Mansfield Park is one that I'm thinking about. This was really before the railroad took over. And yet, if you look at that novel, which isn't one of her most popular, partly because Fanny Price, the heroine of the novel, is a bit of a prig, right? Um, but what she's really looking at is this new social mobility, this ability for people to move about in space. And there are two characters in the novel, Henry and Mary Crawford, brother and sister, who are always on the move. Now, Austin, in her very wonderful, subtle way, is critiquing Mary Crawford for riding horses too fast, because this is an implication that her character is too flippity-jippity. She's moving about. She doesn't have a center of gravity. She's not really located to a sense of place. So I think one of the things that we're dealing with in the presence, which emerged very early in the 19th century novel, was this idea of displacement. So I just want to put that thought out. The other is the railroad <coughs> and the train, which in itself is not only a literal thing, but a great metaphor for change because we are railroaded. I don't know about you, but I feel technologically railroaded in, a, in that I have no choice. This thing is coming at me and it's moving at this incredible pace. I mean, think about it. People were moving from horse and carriage about 10 to 15 miles per hour. By 1829, it was about 30 miles per hour. By 1870, they were moving like 60 miles per hour, up to 78 miles per hour. The whole pace of life was accelerating. Anybody here feel like the whole pace of life is accelerating? Yes. And that we don't have much of a say about it. What they love to do in 19th century novels is actually have people run over by trains. This was a, a great motif. <laughs> um, 
so we get run over by these trains. There's this other thing that I think really comes and emerges out of the 19th century novel, which I think is really applicable today, is that it's going to come for us, these technological changes, whether we like it or not. So you better deal with it. Um, George Eliot, Mary Ann Evans was her real name. She published under the name George Eliot for obvious reasons, male name. Um, and her real masterpiece was Middlemarch. Um, and it was a great period. She was writing it in the 1870s, but it was set in 1829. And she was looking at the whole Reform Act and all of these changes that were happening in society. But she has this marvelous character, Caleb Garth, that she talks about. And he's this farmer. And in the process of reading this novel, we really get to trust his uh, character and his nature. So we know the railroad is coming to Middlemarch. And there's this protest. You know, Luddites like me are out there going, we don't want the railroad. And guess why they were afraid of the railroad? Get this. Because they were frightened that the noise of the steam engines would disturb the cattle and change the way their cattle could be milked and everything might think about the noise pollution today, you know, right? And how we know how it impacts animal behavior. So that's partly why these farm guys were protesting these guys who were coming to survey the, the railroad tracks, et cetera. And Caleb Garth just turns to them and says, I get you guys, and I'm really sympathetic to what's going on, but stop fighting, it's coming, give up. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. And I want to sit with that question. You know, are we encouraged to think through what we're reading and some of the stuff that this is going to happen whether we like it or not? And the third point I want to make is this whole kind of change of power from the concept of God to the concept of science and technology. What are we going to believe in? So there was this huge shift in the 19th century from people who went to church, believed in the absolute word of God. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that's what it was. To this complete blind faith in technology. There's a wonderful scene in Jude the Obscure, which is set in a town which is called something else, but it's actually Salisbury in England, which has that gorgeous 12th century cathedral. And the protagonist wants to meet his paramour at the cathedral, and she says, no, 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 don't want to meet in the cathedral. Where I really want to meet is at the railway station, because that's where the life of the town is. You know, that's, that's the place we can worship now in this land of technology. And one of the things that kind of I guess I'm wrestling with, um, and I'm curious to know if you're wrestling with, is this idea that we have come to believe that technology will save us. That it's not the second coming of Christ, or it's not the redemption or whatever, but that actually technology, a technology, many technologies will arise mm -hmm. and save us from the kind of mess that we're getting in. So I feel like if we go back to the 19th century novel, we can begin to see not only the very concrete, real kind of gritty urban social issues that we grapple with today, but also some of these meta issues. Um, so that's me, Luddite. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I think, um, Mary, you presented the challenge to the two gentlemen, a very different perspective. Um, as I listened, what I was hearing is predicting the future as predicting what technology is and how it works versus the impacts of technology on human beings and on society, the impacts of those changes. How accurately has fiction been doing with that level? And do you guys have any responses to the kind of different perspective that Mary offered? 
Well, it, it's usually ascribed to a yogi bear, but I don't think he was the first one to say it, right? What was it? Something, you know, making predictions is difficult, particularly about the future. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I don't think, anyhow, whatever. I, so, I, no, I, my, my thesis here was that uh, we're not terribly good at predicting it, but it's a lot of fun to read, and, uh, you know, Will can pay his mortgage, I hope, on, on that basis, so th that's good. I, I just want to say something to you, Mary. I used to work for the railroads, and we ran into a lot of people, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we did, usually at high speed. Okay. Um, no, I mean, I don't, you shouldn't rely on fiction to predict the future, mm -hmm. right? Particularly popular fiction. Uh, I've said here many times, I think, I, you know, I, I occasionally consult for films, because uh, LA is not terribly far from where I live, and, uh, you know, I go down there, and they, you know, I'm talking to writers. I'm not talking to technologists. I'm not talking to scientists. I'm not even talking to the people who are going to be in this show. I'm talking to the writers, mm -hmm. and they've got a problem. But you know, in in film, in science fiction film, anyhow, the hero is not the character, right? It's not the, oh, the he's the hero, she's the hero. It's the idea. Mm -hmm. So they want an idea, right? But there are only a few themes in science fiction, cinema science fiction. Let me clarify that right away, well, because I know that written science fiction is a far higher caliber than <laughs> cinema sci-fi. <laughs> But, you know, there are only a couple of themes, like loss of identity, you know, daddy's not daddy anymore, or there were some things humankind was not meant to know. All right, that's, you know, cinema sci-fi, that's kind of anti-science, isn't it? Well, I, don't study that. Ralph, uh, that's something that mankind was not meant to know, right? There's nothing, I don't think you can stop it. That's my last okay. line here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll react to a couple of things there. Um, one of them is I think that science fiction still just has a role to play in getting people aware of ideas um, and thinking about them and thinking about mm -hmm. the implications. When I wrote my first book 10 years ago and I started talking to people about artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, people really didn't know that much about it. And I was just happy that people would ask, like, what's the point? Why do you want your books out there? I'm like, well, I just want people thinking about mm -hmm. this stuff yeah. so that they can have an intelligent conversation about it. Ten years later, I went to a classroom visit um, yesterday, and the kinds of questions I was getting from people in the audience were way more sophisticated. It's like people's knowledge of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and the role that it might play in the future is way beyond where it was ten years ago. Um, so that's awesome, and some part of that right, mm -hmm. comes from media. Um, they won't, there were questions about the movie Her, there were mm -hmm. questions about other movies, so mm -hmm. it's like there's a role to play in exposing people to ideas. So I, I still think it has value even if it doesn't have predictive power, just because it's again causing us to all think about those what if things. From a stopping technology perspective, right? historically we, we don't have a very good job of stopping technology. Mm. Um, but I do believe that we ha at least have the chance to try to influence it. Right. right? If we are aware of it and we're thinking about it, um, then we can influence it. So we could maybe direct where the railroad goes. We're right. not gonna stop the railroad, but we may be able to pick where it goes to minimize the in impact on our livestock, right? Um, right? And the same thing comes from thinking about technology before it actually gets here. So lots of people think it's ridiculous to talk about ge general artificial intelligence and a singularity uh, because that's still mm -hmm. so far off. Um, and from some perspective it is, there's more pressing issues mm -hmm. to think about. But on the other hand, uh, if it does come someday, 20 years out, boy, we sure better have been thinking about it now right. in order to be prepared for that day. Yeah. 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 The, the chair of the AI department at Stanford told me that uh, by 2050, the, you know, a machine will write the great American novel, so. Yeah, you know, so I, I love what you said, uh, Will, about we need to start the conversation. And um, I think that that's really important. And actually, I think sci-fi is an incredible genre. So I do, I do want to be clear on that. Um, because it does bring these things. And I love what you said, is that we can have influence. But I really question, I, I mean, I just do question this idea of we can't stop it. I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, not that I don't want to stop. I, technology. I mean, I'm not somebody who thinks that our lives would be better off if we went back, you know, thousands of years and we didn't have. I mean, that's not what I'm saying. But I think it's very disempowering to have all these technologies really sort of forced upon you without a democratic process where there is conversation, where 
exactly as you said, if this technology is introduced, this is the kind of impact it will have, and you know, let's look at the natural environment, the human environment, and see where these technologies intersect. And I think this idea of it's just going to keep going, which is such a modern concept anyway, it's like it's, it's on the run and it's just going to keep going, um, is, I don't know, I think that's one of the, the things that we should be questioning. Is that really true? Let me ask you this, Mary. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, Lordy. <laughs> you're not feeling well. You yeah. Go to the doctor, right? Yeah, but that's what, yeah, I agree. All right, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. could yeah. be a human doctor, yeah. you know, yeah, some yeah. guy is, yeah. you know, some, some woman yeah. is sitting there, been sitting there all day, get kind of, you know, bored with whole <laughs> business, needs to do her email, whatever. And you ask for a diagnosis, and mm -hmm. she does it on the basis of what she has seen for the past five years, mm -hmm. the symptoms you present. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you ask the computer, the computer has all diseases, uh, all mm -hmm. known diseases in its data banks. And maybe it has some AI, right, machine mm -hmm. learning, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it can make a, and, and this has been demonstrated, mm -hmm. it can make a better diagnosis. Mm -hmm. What are you going to choose for? But you see, I think that's a false choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think that's a false choice. I actually want a human being who will talk to me very intimately about who I am and my symptoms and all of that depth of humanity and contact. And yes, I would want science, but I think that kind of like, who do I want is, I, de I think that might be a bit of a false Let me ask the audience, how many of you would choose for the human doctor? All right, uh -huh. okay. did you count them? And, and, and how many of you would go for the machine? Okay, kind of split. So Older, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> So let me ask a, a, a question. <laughs> let me ask a, a question about that because I've seen some data indicating that the predictive capability of both doctors and airline pilots has been diminished by reliance on technology and AI. So, what do you say to that in this technological discussion? Um, yeah, so that's an issue, and I think we see that also with like the advent of self-driving cars, where we have sort of assisted technology where someone thinks that they're turning over control to their car, but the car is not really capable of handling all the conditions that come up, so now they're less attentive to what's going on on the road, and they're actually in a worse position than they were before. So there's definitely this period of time um, where things get worse. A but, right, long term, I think I'm going to trust an AI to fly my plane or drive my car more than I'm going to trust humans, right? Humans make mistakes, and in certain domains, uh, I really would much rather know that all the cars around me were being driven by AI. Um, especially, you know, if it's one o'clock and the bars have just closed. <laughs> I, I really don't want any people driving cars at that time. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I live in Mountain View, Will, and you know, that's where Google is, for those of you who don't know. It is Silicon Valley. And you know, every day I go out, I see four or five self-driving cars, right? I mean, they all have humans in them, but the humans are usually asleep or you know, on their cell phones or whatever. So the cars are driving themselves. And you know what happens? The problem is the humans, not the ones in the cars, the ones in the other cars. Because these self-driving cars obey, obey all the, all the <laughs> that's right, they obey all the rules of the road. How many people do you know that obey the rules of the road? So they get bullied, right? They get bullied, they get, you know, you pass around them, honk at them, throw things at them. I mean, you gotta, you gotta have everybody in a self-driving car and then you'll save lives. I, I mean, I actually think that some of these things are not, I don't think that these are where the issues are, mm. right? I think um, the, the, if you go to the doctor and you get a better diagnosis from an AI and, and um, a better outcome, I think you're going to be happy about that. I think the question comes in is where does technology start to separate us from our humanity? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, to that end, like you want to talk to a person and that's a perfectly valid human need and desire. And if we don't have that, we've lost something, right? right? And um, we've lost something when we're spending so much time in our smartphones and social media that we're not having face-to-face -face conversations because we know face-to-face -face conversations are different. If you have, if we had a neuroscientist on this panel, they would talk about the effects that you actually have and can be measured when you're face-to-face -face with someone. Mm -hmm. And that being face-to-face -face actually matters whether we're two feet apart or 10 feet apart, like there's differences you can measure. So certainly talking to someone through here is not the same as being face-to-face. -face. Those to me are the big issues. Where do yeah. we lose our humanity? Yeah, yeah. 
Castro, I think that's a great segue into a student question we have, which is what questions should we be asking about artificial intelligence, and I would say technology in de general, instead of the ones about is it alive, is it sentient, what should we be asking about technology, and are there fiction writers who are doing that well? <laughs> um, are there fiction writers who are doing that well? <laughs> I, well, I mean, I, I loved, there were two AI movies that came out. One was uh, Her, and the other one was Ex Machina. Mm -hmm. And I thought that they were relatively close in time, I think. Maybe not at the same year, but maybe one mm -hmm. year after the other. I thought the movie Her was really great because it got at, it didn't require technology that doesn't exist. Like, we, we're not going to make humanoid robots anytime soon that are gonna pass for human. Um, but it asked a much more basic question, which is, can we fall in love with an AI? Can an AI fall in love with us? I think those are great questions to explore. Um, I think we probably all know somebody who's fallen in love online without ever meeting somebody, right? So we, we know that that's possible. Um, so that, that to me is a great scenario, and I like that kind of fiction. Um, Ex Machina is a great story, but it's so implausible to not be super exciting, uh, not uh, not super useful in terms of understanding the near future. I don't know if I answered the question or not. Mm -hmm. no, I, I think that the problem is this, uh, a fundamental problem, anyhow, maybe not the problem, but you know, as soon as you have a generalized artificial intelligence, which is to say a machine that can't just place chess or poker or, or go or any of these things better than any human, but a machine that can do anything cognitively that you can do, and this is, and what I understand for people who work in this field, that's you know a few decades off. It's it's not a thousand years off, right? Okay, but as soon as you have that, the first question you're going to ask is, design a machine better than you are, and then you build that, and then design a machine better than you are, and you build that, right? So then it takes 20 years, following Moore's law, it takes 20 years before one machine is now smarter than all humans put together. Okay, now at this point, I think that the problem becomes, I mean, the the real question you're going to ask at that point is, can I pull the plug here? Right. Can I turn this off if I don't like the results? And I, I'm not saying that you wouldn't like the results. I think by the time you have a machine that's that capable, intellectually, if you will, that it, its interest in you is probably rather minimal, <laughs> right? There, you, you all may know there was a story by, um, well, there you go. <laughs> Where's my machine? Okay. Uh. Anyhow, uh, stand a soft limb. Actually, Sam Soft and it was called Golem 14 or something like that. And the military had built this, this very capable machine that could, you know, do military planning. And then they had that design, the next machine, and it was doing fine. And, you know, but at, after the third machine, it got tired of working for the DOD, particularly given the pay scale. So <laughs> what happened was that the machine was now very, very much smarter than humankind, and it just shut itself off from the humans. It had nothing to do with them unless they tried to turn it off, in which case it would kill them, all right? <laughs> and the qu it was sitting there humming, it was doing something, but nobody knew what it was doing. I think that that may be the ultimate <laughs> AI, because <laughs> in, in the end, you know, the, if the trilobites were able to develop uh, humans, you know, invent their own successors, let's invent humans, or fish, at least <laughs> fish. But if, if they could have invented humans, you know, um, we wouldn't care much about the trilobites anymore. Mm. So I, I think that the, 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 the big problem is what do you do about an AI if you don't like it anymore? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think as you point out, it's kind of like, it, it's this edge case. At some point in time, the AI is so advanced, they just don't care about us. And it's not even worth mm -hmm. their time necessarily to wipe us out, because they'll just go wherever and do whatever they want. Um, but at that period of time when, um, you know, it first comes out, or even before we get to age, uh, artificial general intelligence, right? Like as we're talking about, like the issue with self-driving cars right now is often the case that they're not smart enough, right? We want them to be smarter. Um, and uh, the same thing is true of AI. Once it gets smart, it's gonna solve useful problems for us. Uh, this was a question yesterday actually, like why would we want AI? Well, we have a lot of serious social issues that we need to fix that AI could potentially help us do, and it can drive advancements in medicine, it could drive advancements in material science and sustainability, right? So we want those benefits. Um, it's just about how do we mitigate the risk along the way. Yeah, and I, I love what you're saying too, because I think one of the questions is, you know, what are the questions we ask of AI 
but then what are the questions we ask about what is it to be human? So I think that those two sets of questions really have to be brought up at the same time because there's this sort of, I don't know, merging and um, this I idea of something that's evolving out of our vision and intelligence that then sort of takes over and 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 how are we different and what makes us different, if anything? And I think that if we can hold the tension between getting way more cure, I mean, we know nothing about human consciousness. I mean, we uh, know about Mars, we know about this, we know about that, and yet we know so little about our own human consciousness. So out of this human consciousness, we are developing these extraordinary things that have such power to shape and shift the way we evolve or stop that evolution project of, of the human thing. So it seems to me that there's an equal invitation to get deeply, deeply curious about, as you said, the inside spaces too. And as one of the mm -hmm. questioners in the audience said, is there a point with all of this technology, AI and others, where human beings simply become obsolete? That's a future that I think is presented in fiction. We have a number of questions about the dystopia that appears in so much in fiction today. Let, let's, let's talk about that. W where is this technology going in that dystopian sense? And I, I was laughing, the, the Ebert Interruptus this year is WALL-E, mm -hmm. which if you recall, mm -hmm. and that's a dystopian movie, right? It's a jolly movie, but humans have become the lost agency and you know polluted earth and all this kind of stuff. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. Kind of a trashy movie. It is kind <laughs> of a trashy movie. <laughs> well, well, entertaining. I mean, look, the average lifetime of a species on Earth, just historically, is about a million years, right? I mean, there are exceptions. Sharks have been around for longer, but you know there are plenty of species that haven't been along even around even that long. So a million years. I mean, Homo sapiens is now three hundred thousand years old. I know you're having parties about that. <laughs> but if we, inv if we invent really good AI, you know, maybe <laughs> Kurt's while is right, and you're going to upload yourself into a, a machine and enjoy, in, you know, an infinite existence without the, the bother of having to deal with a body that, you know, kind of breaks down after 30. I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, y I, I'm sure that T-Rex could have sat around, you know, having a smoke and thinking, you know, what it, what, what, what's going to be our future? How are we going to ensure that T-Rex stands or stays around for a long time? Meanwhile, there's this, you know, meteor coming in. I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. You know, I think... It, <laughs> I think what's really interesting about fiction is that for the creative mind, uh, dystopianism is so much more interesting than utopianism, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, I went to that wonderful exhibit at uh, the Fisk Planetarium yesterday called Entopia, I think it was called Entopia, and they talked about choosing the images that they showed. It was this multimedia experience, and they had all these amazing images with music um, on this gorgeous sphere, and they said that they actually, as they were choosing the images, they were much more interested in the dystopian ones, the ones that were kind of chaotic and a little brutal and not so pretty and everything like that. So what that made me think about was, you know, beware, because creative people and fiction writers are going to be drawn to a dystopian vision because it's just juicier, right? And the utopian is all orderly and pretty and blah, you know, we can just sit and look at it and blah. So there's something in us humans and us creative human beings that kind of choose the chaos and just to be aware of that and um, what that means. And does that make dystopia a more likely outcome or is it just one that's more creatively interesting to engage in? W there was a panel I was on this morning and one of the panelists was talking about uh, anti-vaxxers mm -hmm. and how um, none of them are out there trying to harm their children. Mm -hmm. They think that they're trying to make the best decision possible for their children. They're taking in information that happens to be incorrect, but they're using that information to try to make educated decisions about how to make their children's lives be the best mm -hmm. they can. Um, and utopia... Uh, Utopias, the idea of a utopia is it's somebody's vision of making life the best that it can. Right. 
Um, but every d utopia contains a dystopia, right. which is what happens when we get there. Right. And um, I think a perfect example of that is people look at artificial intelligence to replace jobs currently being done by humans, right? 5% of the jobs in the United States basically involve people driving vehicles. At some point in time, all of those jobs will be artificial intelligence. Well, there's 5% of the jobs. You know, um, and that's at one end of the spectrum. And you go, well, maybe if I have a job that requires more intelligence, I won't, not gonna be re replaced by an AI. But you look at doctors and you'd say, well, doctors mm -hmm. are a very educated job. And yet that's another case where we say, we're gonna replace those jobs with AI. So a ton of um, employment opportunities are going to start to evaporate. Now in the past, it's always been the case that one profession going away has led to the advent of other professions coming out. And we haven't, people have always feared that we would sort of go off this employment cliff and it hasn't happened. But we've also never had sort of this wide scale technology. If you have a cotton gin, it's not replacing thousands of different kinds of jobs. It's just replacing this one job, right? AI has the potential to replace thousands of different kinds of jobs. So then what this comes down to is what does life look like if people don't have jobs? And assume that your material needs are met. Assume that you still have money. There's, mag there's economic magic that makes this work. But, but um, yeah. assuming that you yeah. still have your material goods, you still have food, yeah. you still have shelter, but you certainly don't need to work. And people's identity is tied up in their, in their career, people's time, right? Now you have a lot of people, what do they do with their lives? That to me is yeah. the biggest issue and that could be a dystopia. Um, because not a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people are sitting around going home, they'll watch TV tonight, and they're doing what? They're filling up the hours, trying to entertain themselves, and that's not gonna scale. You know, people are not gonna wanna sit watching television 16 hours a day. I think so you're wrong about that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not gonna scale to all people, right? So what we're gonna see is, you know, uh, it, it's gonna be a big problem, I think. Yeah. We're back to Wally people sitting around in chairs drinking their juices and right. wondering about the meaning of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think Will makes an extremely good point though, because this is a danger. Uh, uh, there's some guy came to a lunch we had who works in AI and uh, he talked about you know, machine learning and all the technical stuff. And then at the end, uh, he got the, his first question was, well, how much longer do I have for my job, right? How long does my job mm -hmm. exist? And the guy said, well, look, if what you do is repetitive, you know, you work for H&R Block and you fill out tax forms, you have 10 years. And so the guy said, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. What if, I'm a creative kind of person, right? And so I, you know, I, I, I write screenplays or I, you know, write novels or something. How long do I have? And the guy didn't answer. He just smiled at the audience. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm with you. Yeah. I, I recommend a good nest egg. It, it may be that the machines make, me, make us their pets, and as I've said at the CWA before, I don't really have a big problem with that because they get walked around the block, get fed regularly, get to sleep a lot. <laughs> but I don't want to belittle this problem because this is a big problem. Yeah. This is the biggest is problem big probably, problem. even more so than genetic engineering. Right. And so let's stay with that for a minute. I mean, Mary identified some, what one of the questioners called meta issues that emerged in 19th century literature that we can see now looking back. And I think this one that we've just been talking about is a meta issue we can see today. Are there other meta issues we can see in fiction today that are predicting the future that we should be really paying attention to because they're going to be big things we're gonna to have to deal with as a society or as individuals going forward? You know, one of the, the best books I read recently was The Circle by David Eggers. Have you read it? Mm -hmm. It's dystopian view of um, really kind of the world of Facebook and social media and so on and so forth. Uh, it's um, actually just reality. Sorry? It's just you reality. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. Can say more about that because you're yeah. so much better um, equipped to say Well, that. You, you talk about it and then I'll add my Okay, thoughts. because, well, for me, it was really this this idea of no privacy, um, the new big brother watching us, the idea that there is no private life anymore, that we're all performers for whom we get approval ratings. Um, and there's a wonderful scene in it where 
the protagonist makes love with this guy, and afterwards, all he wants to know is whether he gets a thumbs up or not. You know, it's just like, and she's like, this is not appropriate. And he's like, well, d well did you like it? Do I get a thumbs up? You know, and so, and, but this sense too of this almost cult-like um, running with the pack so that you have to conform now to be a performer within a big show in which everything you do is observed and rated. I mean, that's what came through for me. I'd be really curious what you have to say. No, I, I totally agree with that assessment. Yeah. I mean, it's about the gamification of every yeah. aspect of life, yeah. turning everything we do into something that's rated and monitored. And all of those are based upon the assumption that only a few people can rise to the top and everyone else is not at the top. Right. And that's fundamentally a problem. And we see that today with social media. We see that people create these sort of carefully curated images of their lives to try to make themselves feel better by getting that short-term dopamine hit from the likes on their posts. Um, but what they're creating is not a realistic image of their life. So right. they have an internal sense of dissatisfaction because they know that that's not real. Um, but meanwhile, it makes everyone else who sees that feel like their life is pale and shabby by comparison. Mm -hmm. So they feel bad. So it's making everybody feel bad. And that's us right. doing it to ourselves, right? right? Um, and then you have things like the Chinese government creating a social reputation system for their society as a whole. Um, and this just further exacerba exacerbates the problem significantly. Mm. So building on that with a student question, are authors like the author of The Circle and Ray Bradbury, who was uh, one of my mm -hmm. favorites growing up, are they intentionally writing to warn us? And should we be paying attention to them? I mean, does, does fiction both predict reality and create reality? How do we react to that? I, one of the quotes that I've heard, and I don't know where this comes from, is that science fiction doesn't predict the future so much as to describe plausible possible futures, um, and we decide where we want to go. Um, so I, I think most of those people are seeking to, um, to warn us, to just extrapolate where things are going. And what's scary is, you know, I think when Dave Edgar was writing The Circle, he was imagining sort of a possible future dystopia, and what's scary is just how far along we've gone that what he's writing is reality, not, not you know, a fictional universe. Yeah. You, you, you're saying that makes me think about something because we know the rate of change is accelerating. So science fiction now is, in a sense, it might have been, you know, decades and decades before something discussed in science fiction actually emerged. Do you think there's some kind of... Um, you know, <laughs> it's like we write about it, it happens, ha you know, occurring. I'm curious. No, that definitely occurs with me where I'm writing something and then it comes out before I can actually get my book published. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, so that happens. And there's just this sort of event horizon. And I've done it now twice where I've written myself to a point where I can't see past that point in time. Like, I just have no idea what comes in. Anything that I try to write past that point in time, mm. I just can't. It just doesn't feel real to me. Um, so I think a lot of science fiction writers are facing that unless they're really choosing to write fantasy, right? Like uh, Star Trek is fantasy because of the number of rules that it breaks about the world. Um, so you can choose to write fantasy in which artificial intelligence and social media never happened, um, and, and then you can sort of play further out in the future, but otherwise um, it's very hard. Mm. Yeah, could, can anybody think of any example in which science fiction or any other kind of fiction created the future? I mean, 1984 was a sort of a prediction, yeah. but it didn't create that. Didn't happen. It didn't oh, you think it did happen? Well, maybe. I mean, from certain <laughs> points of view. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it has the capability to do that because the future is created by lots and lots of uh, small decisions made by, you know, billions of people. And so it's, it's hard to think of how a science fiction or any other kind of story could, could actually, you know, influence that. So, so let's talk about small deci decisions in your lives. Each one of you, can you give an example of, of something that has manifested in your life as reality? 
that you first encountered in fiction? Well, finding a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, I think everybody on the panel, you know, w was influenced by fictional mm. stories. Uh, in, in astronomy, I said this yesterday, nobody believed it, but in, in astronomy, uh, I'm sure eight out of ten people who are in the field of astronomy are, um, are in that because of fiction, right? right? And, and they, saw, um, they saw a movie or a TV show or something. Star Trek fan, maybe they read something. And uh, you know, it just seemed like a romantic thing. It wasn't that they were so intrigued by the science, by the way. Um, you know, the uh, National Academy of Sciences has an operation called the uh, Center for, what, what is it, what is it? It's the Science and Entertainment Exchange, that's what it's called. It's down in LA, and they figured if people are influenced to go into science and turn that fiction that they've experienced into their career, then how much better it would be if only the fiction were more accurate, mm -hmm. whatever that means, right? More accurate. So they provide consulting services to the filmmakers and the TV makers. Hey, look, you're gonna have a science fiction story here. Why don't we get a real scientist to talk to you because that way, and I'm actually involved in that, but, but I've never been convinced that it's, you know, it's a good idea in the sense that I occasionally get a free trip to LA, but I, I, I don't think that it, it makes any difference whatsoever, right? I mean, you have a 10-year-old, somewhere between 8 and 11, you know you get interested in something, and you're 10 years old, and you go to a sci-fi film, and I've never seen a kid sitting there when the Starship mm -hmm. uh, Door Prize, Enterprise, what's the name of it? I mean, it goes by the camera, <laughs> right? And you hear, whoosh! <laughs> uh, and, the, and the kid stands up, Mom, I'm not going into science. They got that wrong. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't yeah. matter. Uh. Does it matter to you? Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just sitting with the question about, I mean, fiction's so influenced my life. I mean, mm -hmm. stories, I think, affects us all deeply, and we discover who we are and what we're passionate about or everything. But your whoosh took me off, Seth, to <laughs> being a little girl in a movie theater in London, black and white movie, with a comedian called Peter Sellers. I don't know if anyone's mm -hmm. familiar. He was part of the, the goons. So this... At the end of this movie, it's meant to be really, really funny. Somehow, Peter Sellers, in his full mm. astronaut outfit, is left floating above the moon, and everybody else has disappeared. And I still remember that moment of sitting in that movie theater, watching everybody with their heads rolled back in glee and laughter, and I'm thinking, this is the most terrifying, <laughs> horrifying thing that's ever happened. So this might be why I'm a little Luddite. <laughs> yeah, it's bad for the gong show. <laughs> exactly. Will you remind me of the question? Just, just is, there, is there anything in your own personal life that, that a fiction, either a personal imagining or a fiction that has manifested it re as reality that has been important for you? My favorite fiction was the cyberpunk of the 1980s. Um, uh, I love it. I still love it. I go back and I read it all the time. To me, it still describes a time period that's just like 20 years off, um, even though I thought that in 1985, and it still seems just 20 years off <laughs> in, in whatever year this is. So I don't, I don't know if we'll ever get there or not, but in a lot of ways, it always feels like that's the world that we're creating. Um, so... I don't know, I think about it pretty much all the time. So it sounds like on some level there's some, something that's formed us, whether it creates reality or not, it certainly forms our uh, reaction to it. I think we have about five minutes left, is that correct? Do you guys have any final thoughts you wanna say or do you want me to try and find a final question a here? Questions here? Yeah, so trying to find one that will maybe leave us on an upbeat note. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants an we upbeat can go, note. We no, can come on. Leave in misery. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, how about how about this? So being able. Well, no. Let's do this one. We've got a student one that says, with the loss of AI jobs, 
that mm -hmm. you were saying, or AI losing jobs, is that going to lead to some sort of a global revolution? <laughs> You're going to need the AI to organize the revolution. <laughs> so. uh, yeah. I, I doubt it. There's never been a global revolution. Yeah, but it's kind of interesting thought. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's never been global connectivity before. Well, okay, maybe you all ought to stock up. Mm. You know? mm -hmm. Put a lot of freeze-dried food in the basement. <laughs> But you know, I think that's a great question. Whoever gave that question, I think it's a great question because on a serious note, um, we are we gonna have some choices? Are we gonna make our feelings known? Are we going to protest? Are we going to um, decide what your futures are gonna look like? You, I mean, you know, revolution, you know? Maybe that's what's needed. I don't know, but I, I think it's important to entertain. I just am not into lying down like roadkill while all these things get decided and I have no say in it. So maybe viva the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> You're not roadkill till after you lie down, actually. But <laughs> I, I don't think we're going to have a editor. revolution so much as we're going to have the ability to walk out of society as it exists today, mm -hmm. right? It, you know, if we, if we have this sort of post-scarcity future where the AI is making everything and you don't have to work and now you want to choose what your level of engagement is. I mean, there are people today who don't want technology in mm -hmm. their lives, right? And they mm -hmm. live their life intentionally without having it. So if you want to go live on a commune on an island in Canada, um, you'll go do that and you'll be surrounded by other people who are enabled to do it and it may be more possible um, because there'll be less financial uh, incentive to have to be part of mainstream society. Mm -hmm. So what I think we'll see is just people um, splintering more and creating the subcultures that they want and having the relationship to the technology that they want. I mean, that would, I, to me, would be the most optimistic outcome, hmm. is that people get yeah. to choose the lifestyle that they want. Yeah. Yeah. Mary, I mean, you, you, you know, there's an awful lot of literature out there right now, and I'm sure there have been panels about it, about how looking at small screens is, you know, destroying youth, whatever, right? And, and I'm sure that the, the students here, see, you know about these stories. They know about, well, this is probably not good for me, but hey, you know, you think there's going to be a revolution where they all rise up, we're trashing our phones, that's it. I don't, I don't, see, I don't see it. I don't think it will yeah. happen. The future will tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who was it who said, the future is now, it's just not evenly distributed. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so will there be any role for serendipity and free choice in the future? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Freely chose to say that. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course it will be. Yeah. Yeah. The machines aren't going to run you. Well, but as our as we're limited, I mean, this again, this is a question from the audience. Are we going to lose serendipity and free choice as our world is increasingly taken over by forces that are determining our future? Whether those are technology or you know, the increasing issues we have with climate and loss of ecosystems. We're certainly not going to lose serendipity. We, we, yeah. lose, we lose free choice in some ways and we gain free choice in others. I mean, right now, right, to participate in mainstream society, we do end up getting tied to our devices because we have to communicate with people, right? I want to be connected with friends and family, so I have to be on the social networks that they're on, right? I can make, I can't, I have the option to choose to opt out of these things, but they come at a cost, and sometimes a very considerable cost I might not be willing to pay. Um, but, um, you know, as, as technology goes on, you know, we would, you know, and we don't have to work. There are plenty of people who would like to not have to work, who would like to have the ability to pursue whatever their dreams are, right? So it will give us new freedoms at the same time that it's taking away others. So let's end with this one. If those who go to church go to praise God, do those who praise technology go to sci-fi conventions? <laughs> <laughs> and if not, where do they go? I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> We're all looking they, at you, they, Seth. They, 
they go to the <laughs> app store. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they <laughs> Can I, I actually will take a stab at that. So I, I go to science fiction conventions and I go to tech conferences. Um, and so there are a lot of folks who are, you know, very, very pro-technology at those things. And there is a tendency for people to not look at what the flip side is. What are the ethical concerns? What's the effect on people's lives? Like people don't look at those kinds of things. Right? The beauty of a conference like this is that there's so much more cross-pollination. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really, right, we want to get a bigger cross-section of people at tech conferences, at things like that. Um, so there is a role for the poets and everyone else to show up in those venues. Like if you don't show up, then your voice isn't heard. Um, and so that's uh, an interesting mm -hmm. idea, right, that we could all be pitching panels for tech conferences that we don't have to be technologists to do that. And, and, and honestly, why not be optimistic? I mean, the railroad came along, and sure it was going to scare the cows, okay? I mean, there, was, there were real issues with the, the railroad coming to town. But on the other hand, you know, within 50 years of the railroad coming to town, people's lifespans in, in increased. You know, there were civil engineering projects in the mm -hmm. city that reduced mm -hmm. disease by an enormous amount. Uh, you know, people had the ability to not spend their entire lives within two miles of where they were born. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they could see the world, right? A, a fair fraction of them could, in any case. I mean, there, there were th all these benefits, and sure, there was a downside, mm -hmm. but you have to look at the big picture and, and not say, man, these, these cell phones are really terrible for you. I mean, that's my view. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Great conversation.